I want to continue this morning on our series on why. You know, we've talked about a lot of different things as we've asked the question why, kind of like a two-year-old asks why, you know, and, and they want you to explain everything to them. We've talked about why should I believe in God, why, why Jesus, why, why the conflict between science and the Bible, and, and all these different things. Well, this morning I want to talk about something. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why should I attend church? Maybe you've asked that or maybe you've heard someone say that. And, um, and, you know, this morning, I, first of all, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit. You guys are here, right? You know? And uh, now some of you may not know what that term means, preaching to the choir. You all know what a choir is, you know? They used to be, you know, up here and they'd sing. And they were kind of the people in the church that, you know, they, they had it all together, supposedly, you know? And they, it was like you're preaching to the choir. It's the people that don't really need the preaching, you know? Well... Um, but maybe, maybe you can take something from this this morning that you can, can use as you're talking to your friends and family, whatever. You might have family members who say, well, you know, I don't need to go to church and so forth. Uh, it was interesting as I was thinking about this, um, the other day I was, I was visiting Tom in the hospital and, and as I was visiting with him, the nurse came in and so... I stepped out in the hallway and just waited. And while I was standing in the hallway, I heard this conversation in the room right next door. And I just kind of overheard. The chaplain had gone into that room. And he's talking to this guy in this room. And, and I could hear the whole conversation. The chaplain was asking, you know, if he believes in God and so forth. He says, yeah, you know, I believe in God. And uh, I'm, I'm a Christian. And he says, okay, yeah, what church you go to? And so he named a church. And he, and the, the chaplain says, oh, yeah, okay, uh, who's the pastor there again? And he says, um, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, right, you go to church. He said, but I believe in God, you know, it's just, you know, I've been kind of bad about going to church. I just, you know, don't, don't go all the time, but, but uh, I'm a believer. Any of y'all know, know people like that? They believe in God, but they don't really uh, think it's important to go to church. And, you know, in this age of electronics, um, you can stay at home on your couch and you can watch some great pre preaching on TV or on the internet. And I get that, you know, there's, there's preachers on there that are much better than I am. So we can't really use the argument, well, you've got to come to church to hear great preaching. Because um, you can see all that in the comfort of your living room. Um, you know, people say all the time, I believe in God, I love Jesus, I just don't want to go to church. I want to ask the question, can you do that? Can you be a Christian and not be a part of a church? People say, I believe in God and I love Jesus. I just don't like organized religion. Oh, so you like unorganized religion? Is that it? Um, that's kind of like telling Jesus, well, Jesus, you know, I like you. I just don't like your wife. The church is the bride of Christ, right? The church is the bride of Christ. I think sometimes the problem we have is we have this preconceived idea of what church should be. We have this idea that everyone in church should be perfect and never do or say anything hurtful and everything should be just great in church. Well, let me, let me, let me just throw that out the window right now. Any vibrant, growing, effective, life-changing church is a hospital for the sick it's not a shrine for the saints, okay? In any vibrant, growing, life-changing church, we will have people at every level of maturity, from the non-believer just coming in, to the new Christian who needs a lot of growth, to the mature person who seems to have it all together. So there's all kinds of different people that make up a church, and church is not perfect, so stop expecting it to be perfect, all right? Now, I get that as a believer in Jesus Christ, I can be a Christian, and we're all part of this global church, right? The bride of Christ, the global church who's made up of Christians all over the world. And being a Christian is, in fact, based on your belief in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So yes, I would say you can be a Christian and not go to church. But I think the better question to ask is, can you be all that God wants you to be without being a part of a local church? Can you be all that God wants you to be without being a part 
of a local church. So what is a church really? Well, a church is not a building. Get, a, get that out of your mind right now. You should never make a decision on what, what church you're going to attend based on a building. A church is a group of people gathering together for the purpose of worshiping God, studying his word, and encouraging each other. Okay, so as I asked myself this question, why should I go to church? What does church mean to me? I came up with seven things this morning, and there's probably many more. You could probably come up with some of your own, okay? But here's my seven things this morning. Number one, because I need a way to use my gifts. I need a way to use my gifts. Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Now, when I started this message, I did a search on my computer for all the verses that have one another in them. One another. And I came up with a lot of them, many more than what I can actually use this morning. So I've underlined all the one another's. I want you to pay special attention to the one another's because when it talks about one another, how can you do one another without when you're by yourself, right? You can't do that when you're by yourself. So when we think about one another... Um, it says, serve one another humbly in love. How do we do that? Well, God gives each of us some spiritual gifts, right? Um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can't exercise those gifts sitting at home in your recliner watching TV, okay? It takes interaction with other people to be able to put those gifts into practice. Romans 12 it says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. What is prophesying? Prophesying is taking the word, explaining it in, in today's language, explaining it in today's applications to people. You can't do that when you're by yourself, okay? If it is serving, then serve. How can you serve if you're by yourself? It takes a group, it takes a community of people to be able to serve each other. If it is teaching, then teach. How are you going to teach anybody? If your gift is teaching and you're sitting at home and you say, I'm a Christian, but I'm just going to sit at home and watch TV, how are you going to use that gift if you don't have anybody to teach? It takes a community of people to be able to do that. Um, if it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Once again, to be able to encourage someone. You need to be, have a, someone to encourage and, and build people up. If it is giving, then give generously. If you have the gift of giving, where are, you, where are you going to give to? There's no better place to give than the local church, and it can exponentially um, multiply your giving and use it in a, in a good way. If it is to lead, do it diligently. Who are you going to lead if you're not involved with a local community? And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Again, talking about people being together. So in order to utilize these gifts, you need other people. You need other people. Where are you going to do that? You're going to do that at the grocery store? The best place is the local church, I believe. You know, that's what I love about church. I love seeing people coming together. In fact, I wanted to wear my t-shirt. I love my church. You all got those t-shirts, right? But my, my wardrobe consultant, <laughs> said, you're not wearing a t-shirt to church. <laughs> you all think it would have been all right? Yeah. Yes, you're outvoted, oldie, sorry. <laughs> Next time I'll wear my t-shirt, all right? I love my church. <laughs> okay. Okay, the second thing is because I need encouragement from other believers. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore, here's another, one another encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing you know the christian life may not always be easy sometimes we need some encouragement sometimes we need uh, building each other up there are some bumps in the road when you get down you may need an encouraging word here's another verse but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness I don't know about you all, but a Sunday is the highlight of my week. 
we come to church, we see each other, and you know, some of you are just such positive people. You encourage me, and you build me up. And then, you know, the smile, the handshake, um, the hug, a text message. Later on, sometimes people will text me and say, you know, that was a great message. Or whatever. Just encouraging each other, building each other up. You people are incredible. I got, I got to tell you, the other night we were going to go to the relief sale for um, Friday night for supper. And so we were telling Meg we're going to go to the relief sale, and she was, she's asked, you know, where? And, and she wanted to know who was going to be there. She said, name, name. She kept saying, name. Who's going to be there? She was afraid she was going to be in this big crowd of people who wouldn't know anybody. Yeah, right. So we tried to think of some people that would be there and, and so forth. And, and uh, so we're wheeling Meg in there in her, in her wheelchair. <laughs> we couldn't hardly get to the food. Everybody kept coming up saying, hi, Meg, you know, and talking to Meg. And you, know, you don't know how much of an encouragement that is to her and to us. And a lot of those people were because of church. Whether it was this church or some other churches we'd been at, um, it was because of church. And that, just that encouragement that we all need. We all need that, don't we, uh, from time to time. Um, the third thing is because I need people around me who love me. Over and over again, we're told to love one another. This verse in John 13 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. And he tells his disciples, there's something new I'm going to tell you. Um, you know, there's like 600 rules that the Jewish people had. But here he says, there's something new that I'm going to give you. This new command. And this new command was for the church. It was for this church that was just starting, just at its very infancy, just beginning, laying the foundation for the church. This was something different. He says, you are to love each other as I have loved you. Well, think about how did Jesus love his disciples? How did he love us? He loved us enough to lay down his life for us, is how he loved us. And Jesus says, you're to do that. You know, it's great to be around people who love us, who care about us. First John says that we'll be recognized by our love, by our love says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Because God is love. There's a few verses in Romans chapter 12 that you don't have to turn to. But we were talking about this in, uh, in Bible study the other night. And I remember mentioning that, that uh, you know, if, if just everyone would practice these principles... If everyone would do, what a different world this would be if everyone would practice what he talks about in these few verses in Romans chapter 12. When he says, I'm just going to start reading a few verses in verse 9. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Notice all these things have to do with a group of people working together. You can't do that if you're not part of a local body, I don't believe. He says, do all these things in love. He goes on, he says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. What a better thing for the church. You know, it's great when you, when you have something great happen in your life and you have friends to share it with and they rejoice with you. It's also great when you have something bad happen in your life and you're mourning and you're sad when you have people who will come and they will cry with you as well. Where do you get that if you don't get it in church, in a church family? That's why we need each other. 
in as part of a church body, as part of a church family. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Then he says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. All these things are talking about relationships, about loving one another. A couple more verses, a couple more one another verses. In Romans 12, 10, we just talked about that. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. In Hebrews, it says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. I don't know about you, but I need that. I need that. I need to experience that environment where there are people who love me, who really, really care about me. Here's a fourth one. Because I need someone to help me when I'm down. I need someone to help me when I'm down. Ecclesiastes says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Some of you have had the experience of being going through a rough time when people of the church have come and, and have, have helped you. Maybe some of you have experienced um, after having a baby or having, go, having, a, having a surgery when people, the ladies of the church come and they bring you meals. I remember uh, years ago when Goldie had surgery and the, the, uh, the church brought us meals. And you don't know how much I appreciated that because... Um, if I'm cooking, eggs and McDonald's get old pretty quick. <laughs> okay? And so we appreciated that, those meals coming in. And I know um, we're doing some of, that, some of that now, I believe. And so just those times when the church can gather around, when someone is, is having a hard time and they need, they need some help. And it's a beautiful thing for a church to be able to do that, to come together and to help each other. Here's the fifth thing, because I need the right environment to grow. I need the right environment to grow. I used to raise pigs. Now, don't go telling anybody your pastor compared you to a pig on church, all right? But I used to raise pig, and I worked hard to create the right environment for my pigs to grow. I made sure that they had the right, uh, the right place to be, the right kind of bedding, the right ventilation, the right feed. Everything they needed, clean water, everything they needed to be able to grow. Uh, made sure they had the right uh, nutrients in their food. The church should be the right environment to grow. Should be the right environment to grow. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another, there's another one of those, another, one another's, with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Notice it says the central theme, the message of Christ. May the message of Christ dwell in you richly. And it says we should teach each other. We should build each other up. We should teach that. And that's what we strive to do here at church is, is create the environment where that message can be instilled into us. And we do that through having the right music, having the right music with the right message, and also through the, through the, 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 uh, the preaching and so forth. Creating the right environment. Now, on the pig farm, we also had some things that the pigs didn't like. Um, we had fences. Oh, how they hated fences. They complained about fences. They tried to crawl over fences. They tried to burrow under fences. They would try anything to get outside those fences. And they, 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 they didn't like the fences, but they didn't know that those fences were good for them. Those fences kept them within a, a confined space. They kept them within um, the space where they were safe. If they got outside of those fences, they might be susceptible to, to who knows, to coyotes, uh, to busy roads to mom's garden, and if <laughs> pigs got in mom's garden, they were in trouble. It's kind of like the rabbits getting in Goldie's garden now or in her flower bed. That's a dangerous place to be. She's gotten really good with a BB gun. 
<laughs> you know, the other day, Goldie's driving down the road just about a mile east of our house, and there's four sheep beside the road. And these sheep, <laughs> they're, on, they're on the loose. They're wild. They're, they're, we talked to one of our neighbors. We thought it might be his sheep. And he said, no, I don't know. They're not mine, but I know whose they are. And they've been out, they've been out for about two weeks. They can't find them. They can't crowd them with all the corn and everything. They went out into the cornfield. We don't know where they are. And, uh, and they, I'm afraid they'll get eaten by coyotes, but after harvest, maybe they'll be able to round them up. But they're, they're just out there, away from the fence. You know, there's a verse in that word that I just, or in that ver, a word in that verse I just read called admonish. The word admonish means to warn, to warn. That brings us to the next thing that I need. I need someone to hold me accountable. Someone to hold me accountable. Someone who is, who is there to say, whoa, stop, danger ahead, right? Look at this next verse in Luke 17. It says, so watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. We don't like to do that, do we? We don't like that. In fact, I don't like to do that. But sometimes it's necessary when we see someone doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And we can see down the road and we can see the consequences of their actions to be strong enough to have a good enough relationship with them to go up to them and say, Whoa, stop! Danger ahead! There's a fence here. Don't cross this fence. We need that. You're not going to get that if you're not plugged into a church. A church that believes the word. Hebrews 10, 24 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, there's, there's a couple horse riders in here, a couple cowboys in here that know what a spur means. A spur means to, is used on a horse to kind of guide a horse in a certain direction, right? It's kind of to get a horse to do what you want them to do. And that's what we're to do to one another. We're, we're to help one another. We're to spur one another in the right direction. And you're not going to do that unless you have a relationship with one another. Unless you do the next thing, which is Ephesians 5.21. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Submit to one another. If you're submitted to one another, then you will have the relationship with one another where you can spur one another. And sometimes that takes time to develop that. It takes time to develop that to where you have that relationship with one another. Well, that brings me to the final one this morning. It's probably the most important and probably the least understood reason why I need to be in church. And that is because I need the power of numbers. The power of numbers. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 18, and it was in the context of prayer. He said, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. There am I with them. See, there is something amazing that happens when a group of believers come together and they lift their voices in praise to God. There's something powerful that happens when a group of believers come together and they lift their voices in praying to God. There's something that happens in the spiritual realm when, when believers are linked together and they storm the gates of heaven with praise and prayer. There's something amazing that happens in the cosmos that we can't see and it's kind of hard for us to understand sometimes. But it will never happen when we're by ourselves. It only happens when we have a group of people coming together and we, we have that power coming together within all of us. You know, Jesus came to his disciples and he said, disciples, who do men say that I am? Some of them said, some of them say this and some of them say that. He said to Peter, he said, Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you are right, Peter. And he said, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What was that rock he was talking about? 
I believe that rock he was talking about was Peter's confession of faith in Jesus Christ. When Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, there's power in that confession of faith in Jesus Christ. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We saw this play out just um, days later, maybe months later, in Peter's own life. Peter was put in prison in uh, Acts chapter 12. Peter was put in prison. The next morning he was going to trial and probably going to be executed. The Bible says the church had met together in a house. It probably wasn't a church like this. It was probably a group of people had gotten together in a house and it says they were praying earnestly. They were praying earnestly. And you know what happened? An angel came into that prison, woke Peter up and said, Peter, follow me. And they walked right past the guards. They walked right through the gate and they walked right out on the street. And it wasn't until they were several blocks away that all of a sudden Peter woke up. He thought he was having a dream. And he woke up and, where am I? Where am I? He was out of the prison. Why? Because there was a church full of people praying. The power was unleashed because there was a church full of people praying. Because Jesus promised where two or three are gathered in my name, there, there I am in the midst of them. We need the power of numbers. The power of numbers. When we come together as a group in unity and we stand on the rock of our unified faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus said, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I don't know how many of you remember a few years ago when we remodeled the church. And we put new carpet up here. Some of you weren't here then, but some of you were. We put new carpet up here. And remember, we had everybody come up and we wrote names under the carpet on this stage. One Sunday morning, we had everybody come up and we, we just wrote a bunch of names. And there's hundreds of names under this carpet. And we committed that we're going to pray for those people. And we prayed for those people that morning and and we committed over a period of time to, to pray for those people. And, and I know some of the names that are under that carpet. I don't know near all of them, but I know some of them. And I know, I know there's a few that are here this morning because of that. I know there's one young man that I met just recently. I hadn't seen him for years. I knew him for a long time ago. Hadn't seen him for years. And, and he, he had a, an addiction problem with drugs and alcohol and, and everything. I got to talking to him and... And uh, he said, you know, he's, he doesn't come to this church, but he, he, he's going to another church, and he's, he's, he's getting rid of his addiction. He's getting his life back together, and, and things are happening in his life because people are praying, because people are praying. See, that's why we need the church. That's the power of a group of people coming together and praying and praising God. You'll never experience that as a lone wolf, as a lone wolf. That's why I need the church. That's why I need the church. There are many other things that we could go into. I've got a list of a whole bunch of verses I'm not going to get into. All the other one another's that we could go to. There's a lot of them. So when somebody tells you, somebody tells you, How do I, I can be a Christian, I don't need church. What are you going to say? Are you going to have a better answer for them this morning? after what you've heard. I hope so. It is important. Yeah, they can believe in God. They can believe in Jesus and not go to church. But they'll never experience what God really wants for them without being part of a church community. 